Hello everyone. Welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today's episode is called In the Presence of Extraterrestrials, 10 True Cases. As you know, if you watch this show, I absolutely love talking about ETs, humanoids, aliens, call them what you will. But to me, face-to-face -face encounters with extraterrestrials are the most interesting kinds of all UFO cases. There's so much to learn from them. They're just so darn fascinating. There's so many of them. They provide all kinds of evidence and really answer a lot of the questions about what it's like to have contact and why the ETs are here, where they come from, what their agenda is, and so forth. So, these 10 cases I've chosen today are mostly little-known cases. I love digging up those ones that most people haven't heard of before. And as always, they come from all over the world. So I've got cases from Canada, I've got cases across Europe, England, Italy, Spain, France, as well as across South America, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, and of course, all across the United States. And the cases I've picked today start way back in the 1950s and move all the way up through the 2000s. So some pretty recent cases as well. And as always, involving a wide variety of humanoids, all types of evidence, lots of multiple witness cases, and cases with unique and interesting elements that I think have something to provide, something to help us understand what it's like to have ET contact. So, this is going to be a long episode. Let's get started. In the first episode I'd like to talk about today, I call a UFO like a silver bullet. And this took place in August 1956 in Badajoz, Spain. I like this case because it's a quite early case. It's pretty unusual. It's a clear example of a UFO display, ETs showing themselves off and it's also got a whole lot of witnesses. The primary witness in this case, one of 30 witnesses, by the way, has requested anonymity and is known only by his initials, C.S. And it was one sunny afternoon around 2 p.m. in August of 1956, and the witness, C.S., was about five years old, and he was playing football with a group of about 20 other kids in a large meadow that all the kids used. This was in the village of Grana de Torre Hermosa. And this is where they would play each day. And so they're out there playing football when suddenly a roaring noise fills the air and coming from a distance was this silver bullet shaped object swooping over the houses in the distance and coming towards them. Now I will just quote the witness directly. He did give an interview in French and I found the original article with his testimony. And as CS says in his own words, we saw a machine arrive at fantastic speed and there were two guys inside. It arrived by doing this. He made a circular motion. The object came roughly from the north towards the west, then veered towards the east. It happened like that. We were playing. It passed over us and stopped 500 meters away. As it arrived, we heard a strange, absurd noise. First we heard the noise. We were playing football and it was because of the noise that we began to look. It was like a jet plane, a very loud noise. It was an extraordinarily loud noise. It was crazy. It's incredible speed. But it stopped like an arrow in a straight line. I don't know what they were doing, but they seemed to be looking at us. Then, people from the street came running, women especially because the men were at work in the fields or elsewhere, they were alerted by the noise and cries of others. We had never seen a machine like that. It started to slow down and we started running behind. It slowed down more and more and stopped a half kilometer away. It happened very quickly, a very rapid deceleration. And then it hovered in the air without anything touching the ground about three meters from the ground. And there were two guys in it. I couldn't tell you how it was made. It was transparent, but not all of it. We could see inside. 
We saw the people, but we couldn't see their legs. We only saw the head and shoulders. I thought they were sitting, because it wasn't very wide, the thing, maybe one meter in diameter. So everyone there was totally amazed. Nobody had ever seen anything like it, and many of them were familiar with aircraft, having recently been through a war. This object was sleek and shiny, metallic. They said it looked like aluminum. And as C.S. says, we could see the heads of the two men inside. So there were 30 people who came running. And at least I was one of the last because I was kicking the ball. I had to pick it up. So let's say I was 30 or 40 meters behind the others. But everyone was running. And then, when they were about 50 meters from this object, it took off again. And it was out of sight of us in a second, practically. It went away like a bullet at fantastic speed I've never seen before. It left like that towards the east. So, this craft left when the people had gotten pretty close to it, about 150 feet. And the main witness got close enough to see that these figures inside did not appear to be wearing any flight suits. He said they had a skin color unlike anything he'd ever seen, as he says, quote, kind of greenish. Though otherwise, he says they looked human. But he did also see what looked like some sort of antenna on the top of their heads. And he had the very strong impression that the occupants of the craft had stopped intentionally so that everyone could see it. And in fact, after it stopped, the figures inside the craft turned their heads and looked at all the witnesses. Some of the witnesses at this point waved at the occupants, gesturing for them to land. The occupants waved back, but instead of landing, took off. And strangely, afterward, as we see in so many of these cases, there wasn't much talk about it at all. But, as the main witness CS says, it made a huge impression on me. It was something he would remember for the rest of his life. Certainly an interesting case. I think it's even more interesting that the witnesses waved at the ETs and they waved back before quickly taking off. So, a really unusual case, but there are others like it. And here's another one which I really wanted to include because I think it has some interesting takeaways to it. I call this one Us or Them. And this took place in the fall of 1965 in the very small town of Ross, North Dakota. Actually, outside of Ross, North Dakota. I like this case because it was professionally investigated by a MUFON researcher, and it involves a classic flying saucer with humanoids. But are they ET, <laughs> or could they possibly be humans? So this is a case which I think we need to take a real close look at. This case was investigated by Richard Moss of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. And again, it shows how careful you have to be when trying to determine the nature of a UFO landing with occupants. And it took place just outside of the very small town of Ross, North Dakota. And the main witness is a farmer by the name of Keith Myers. And in fact, the incident took place on his farm. It was a moonlit night around 11 p.m. one evening in the fall of 1965. Keith was inside his house, looked out the window, and noticed a strange object had landed in his fields, reflecting in the moonlight, not too far away. Not super close, either. And as Keith says, I saw the craft after noticing light reflecting off of it. I then took a rifle with a good scope, set it on the window ledge, and viewed the craft. I could see it had two occupants in flight helmets and wearing military-type flight suits. I could see faces through the helmets after I switched my refractive telescope. They were human, and I presumed most probably military. So while the figures did appear to be human-looking, the craft most definitely did not look conventional. And as you can see from the drawing made by the witness, it appeared to be very much your classic flying saucer. And as Keith says in his own words, the craft was grayish silver, saucer-shaped, 
with three supports or tripod struts. A windshield wrapped partly around the craft in front. It had what I now assume were flight surfaces, but, but not flaps or such as traditional winged craft used. It sat there for perhaps less than an hour. I was doing something in my room while I sat on my desk watching it. My eyes got tired of viewing through the scope, and when I looked up, it was gone. No engine sound or roar. So Keith wasn't quite sure what to make of this. So the next morning, he decided he would go to investigate the landing location. And as he says in his own words, I did go to where I thought the craft had sat, and in rather freshly cultivated field, the pads made imprints about an inch and a half to two inches. So this was a solid object, it clearly wasn't his imagination, something had landed there, but he was puzzled. Human or ET, us or them. Either way, what was it doing in his field? And a few days later, he received some startling additional information about this encounter. As he says in his own words, while driving back roads, we noticed an enclosed wagon setting off the road in a real rural area with an Air Force pickup sitting beside it. An airman was standing with an N-16 on guard. We stopped and began talking with him, and eventually with the two others inside, and asked them what they were doing. As it had a radar dish on top of the wagon, they replied that they were supporting helicopters while the Minuteman missiles were being installed. However, perhaps after about two hours or so, I asked the first airmen what they were really up to, and I told him about the craft I had seen. He said that's what they were really up to, supporting this new surveillance craft. So, here we have a military officer telling a farmer that the flying saucer he saw was military. But again, if so, what was it doing landing in Keith Meyer's field? And, furthermore, what is a military officer doing revealing state secrets? Could this have been a deliberate misleading of the witness? I don't know. The witness came away believing it was a military craft. But again, it shows that just because someone sees a landed UFO with occupants, you can't assume anything really about where it's coming from. So as I said, I mean, you can't be careful enough when interpreting these cases. I think it's very possible that that was, in fact, reverse engineered ET technology. Then again, can't be sure. I find it quite unusual that they would just land right in this farmer's yard like that. I also find it unusual that the military officer that the witness spoke to admitted so freely that this was ours. Could that be sort of a red herring or disinformation? I don't know. Again, you'll have to make up your own mind about it. But I thought it was important to include because this question is something we do need to take a close look at. And here's another case, which I think is clearly extraterrestrial. This one did get quite a bit of publicity. I'm not sure you've heard it before, though it is fairly well known in its country of Argentina. And I call this one, You Are Going to Know the World. This is mostly a single witness case involving a young teenager. However, there were some outside supporting witnesses. It took place on July 2nd, 1968, during a huge wave of sightings in this area. The actual location of this encounter was Sierra Chica, Argentina. And it's quite an unusual case with some very interesting physical evidence and a very unusual, to say the least, interaction with extraterrestrials who look largely human but clearly aren't quite like us. The main witness in this case is 14-year-old Oscar Iriart, and he had an experience which would cause a local sensation in his small town of Sierra Chica, Argentina. Now, at the time, he was working as a bookkeeper at a local bakery, so he's an upstanding young man. But it was around 11.30 a.m. He was horseback riding not too far from his home, he had his young puppy with him, and as he came around a bend in the road, 
he saw two men ahead of him, gesturing for him to approach. They were out in the field and kind of approaching towards the road. And he thought at first that they were bird hunters. He says they were five and a half feet. They had short white hair. They wore red shirts, white pants, black shoes. But they were unusual looking for sure. And they looked identical. As Oscar says, Apart from the constant unblinking way in which they gazed fixedly at me with their deep-set eyes, they might have been just any ordinary men, such as we see every day here in Sierra Chica. I approached, and they told me to get off the horse and that they were going to take me. So I did, and they told me they were carrying a load. They said they came loaded. So at this point, they pointed to a landed craft just a short distance behind them, in the culvert in this field. And according to Oscar, this craft was saucer-shaped, silvery metallic, not very big, about six feet long, very thin. It stood on three landing legs. As he says, the apparatus was oval with three legs. I couldn't see anything inside. So at this point, one of the men spoke to him in Spanish out loud and said, you are going to know the world. And Oscar said, yes, of course, when I have money enough. And the visitor, the visitor said, no, we will take you. We cannot take you now as we have a big load. Now, at this point, Oscar started to notice some very unusual features. In fact, it looked like these guys' legs looked almost transparent. He could see the barbed wire fence behind them through their legs. So this was very confusing to him, but he became distracted when one of the men reached down and handed Oscar a note. And he said it had a message for him. But first, before he, reading this note, this man asked Oscar to dip the note into a puddle of water. A strange request, certainly, but Oscar did as he was told. He walked up to a nearby puddle. The two men walked right behind him, following him. And as he dipped this paper in the water, he was surprised to see that it remained completely dry, and so did his hands. So that was very unusual. And this is when he looks down at the note and reads the message, which is written in Spanish. And uh, there were the words, You are going to know the world. And it was signed P. Saucer, or apparently signed. You can see the note here. Now, this is very strange. Uh, the word you is usted in Spanish. It was missing the last letter D. So it appeared to be very crudely written. Now at this point, the men walked back over to the craft, kind of lifted the top, climbed inside and closed it. At this point, very quickly, the machine took off vertically at high speed in total silence, but with a brilliant flash of light and in just a few seconds, it was a tiny spot high in the sky and was gone. And as Oscar says in his own words, I didn't feel anything strange. They talked to me and I answered them. I didn't feel anything. Those who study say they spoke to me by telepathy. But I saw that they spoke to me as you are talking to me now. Finally, when they left, they told me they weren't taking me because they were carrying cargo. The apparatus opened upwards, and the two guys got in like that, standing inside. I didn't feel any noise or anything, and it went straight up, without a sound, until it was lost. So at this point, Oscar felt almost as if he was waking up from a dream or something, but realizing he had experienced something very unusual, fear flooded through him, and he wanted to rush home, but as he approached his horse, he found that his horse was paralyzed, and so was his dog. They couldn't move, and they remained that way for the next five minutes, which absolutely freaked him out, but finally they broke out of this paralysis. Oscar got on his horse and galloped the half-mile home, crazed. I mean, some people saw him and were surprised at the state of his panic and fear. Arriving home, his parents were very concerned by his wild-eyed, terrified state, uh, he very excitedly told them what had happened, showed them the note. So they were astonished by this, somewhat skeptical and disbelieving. 
but they could see that their son was very emotionally distraught, so they and some neighbors immediately returned to the spot where Oscar said this happened, and they were amazed to see three holes in the ground in the shape of a triangle, a perfect isosceles triangle, six feet on one side and four and a half feet on the other two, and the holes were about five or so inches deep. So word spread fast, and military officials from nearby Olaveria showed up to take soil samples. Meanwhile, Oscar's father, Heriberto Antonio Eriart, went to the police and reported the incident to Sergeant Raul Coronel, who refused to take any action, refused to take the story seriously. He believed it was just too ridiculous to be true. But events weren't over yet, because that evening, this sergeant, Sergeant Coronel, was at the Sierra Chica Social Club with a group of other men, and they began talking and joking about this incident and Oscar's crazy experience. And all of them were skeptical, but just on a lark, they decided to go visit the landing site. They brought a powerful flashlight. They arrived at around 11.15 p.m., went to the area, and they verified that there were holes in the ground, but they thought that these holes could have been easily faked. The soil was quite loose. But that's when one of these men, his name is Carlos Mar Marin Angeli, he's a butcher, he shouted out to the others, Look out! A light is coming in our direction. And they all looked, and sure enough, there was this brilliant object approaching them was only a few meters above the ground, but it was zigzagging in this strange pattern towards them. And the men became quite frightened. They threw themselves to the ground as the light approached them. And in fact, the sergeant, Sergeant Coronel, pulled out his revolver and was about to shoot at the light when the other men dissuaded him, told him it probably wasn't a good idea. At this point, the object moved across the field, suddenly increased in speed, then immediately darted straight upwards at super high velocity and was gone. So needless to say, all five of the men were convinced now that UFOs were real and that probably Oscar had described a real experience. And they returned to the station where they were questioned by the other police there and reporters. And they described what they saw and said, yes, the flying saucers do exist. Not surprisingly, Sergeant Coronel was chastised later by his superiors for talking to the press without first having submitted a report to them. But this just created an absolute interest in what Oscar had experienced, and soon crowds of people began to mob the Erie Arts to stake out the field where these UFOs had been seen. Now, the neighbors did say that the Erie Arts were a respectable family, and Oscar's whole family stood by him. As Oscar says, everyone in my family believed me because they know me as a child, as I am. I'm Catholic. Now, he wasn't a strict Catholic, but apparently he's known as an honest child. And in fact, his mother said that Oscar refused to set foot in that field for nearly a year afterwards. That's how frightened he was. Nor did he want to go out at all because everyone wanted to talk to him about what had happened. And as she says, now he doesn't talk about those things anymore. Now, in further support of Oscar's experience is the fact that during this time, Argentina was experiencing a massive wave of UFO activity. In fact, as investigated by Argentine researcher Gustavo Fernandez, just a few weeks after Oscar's encounter, the same month, and about 50 miles away in Tepalque, Argentina, three soldiers of the Argentine army said that they came upon three humanoids and a landed craft. These humanoids were just walking around the craft. They went to investigate and get close, but as they approached, they said the ETs shot a beam of light at them. At this point, they weren't unable to move and could not move until these ETs got back in the craft, which departed. So certainly a fascinating series of events. Oh yeah, I mean, 
I don't know. That case is really unusual, given that the kid was given a paper note by the ETs. And honestly, I probably would have dismissed it if not for the outside supporting witnesses and the landing traces and the fact that his own family really stands behind him and believes he was telling the truth about it. Because it's such an unusual case. It's definitely a bit of an outlier, but appears to be legitimate. And th this witness was followed up through the years and he's still sticking to his story to this day. So make of it, make of it what you will. Because <laughs> there's always another case. Uh, and that's what's so amazing about this phenomena is the huge number of cases. I've said it before, but it bears repeating. The general public has no real idea just how common this is. And again, most people don't talk. So we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg here. And here is another case, which is probably my favorite in this little collection, because, wow, this witness was able to converse with the ETs and just get loads of information about them. I call this, uh, this particular segment, <laughs> Everything is God. And yeah, a very unusual case, which took place in July of 1968 at Grodner Pass in the Dolomite Mountains of Italy. It is a single witness case, though there is physical landing traces in support of it. Uh, there are some who are skeptical of it, but honestly, I think this case is legitimate given the details that this gentleman describes. Uh, in fact, you can hear a first-hand interview with him if you search out the internet. I know the channel Eyes on Cinema covered this case briefly, but it definitely is worth taking a deeper look into because it's a fantastic case. The main witness in this case is Walter Rizzi, and as I said, his encounter occurred in July of 1968. But there's a little bit of a prequel to this case. Because back in 1942, Walter Rizzi was working as an interpreter between the Italian and German air forces in Greece. And it was here that he had the opportunity to meet a local holy man who was allegedly more than 100 years old and gifted with all kinds of psychic ability, astral travel to other worlds, he says, would give prophecies of the future, and things like this. And so he sort of became friends with this holy man. And at one point, this holy man told Walter Rizzi that one day in his future, he would have an encounter with, quote, beings from the cosmos. And Walter was very impressed because the old man had already shown him many miraculous things. Then, decades later, one evening in July of 1968, Walter was driving through the Grodner Pass in the Dolomite Mountains of Italy and became fogged in. So he had to pull over as the fog was so thick, it was too dangerous to navigate the pass. And he pulled over and was dozing in his car when he woke up because he could smell something burning. And he thought it might be his car, which was turned off, but going outside it clearly wasn't his car. And then through the mist, he saw a brilliant bright light. And as the mist parted, he saw this quote, enormous thing which had landed on the ground not too far away from him. Now he instantly thought of the holy man's prophecy that was given to him many years earlier and realized that the prediction was likely now coming true. And he became filled with this fantastic excitement. He quickly grabbed his flashlight and approached the craft. But he discovered something very interesting. He could only get so close to it before he hit a strange invisible barrier. He tried to get closer, but he couldn't. Something was holding him back. So he just stared up at the craft in amazement. And as Walter says, in his own words, the object was wonderfully beautiful, silvery in color, and about 80 meters in diameter, standing on three legs about two meters long and about two meters thick at the bottom. The UFO was bathed in a fleecy white light. The transparent cupola on the top of the craft now lit up brightly, and I saw two beings in it who were looking down at me. 
On the right hand side of the machine, there was a robot about two and a half meters high and with three legs and four arms. You can see it pictured here. And as Walter says, it was holding the outside of the craft and making it rotate. From the center of the craft came a beam of light, violet and orange in color. And from within this beam of light, I saw coming down out of the craft, a being dressed in a tight fitting suit and with a glass hood over the head. He came right up to me until he was no more than one meter from me. So Walter says that this being was just under five feet tall, had a wide head, short hair, kind of looked like fur, he said, wide set, slanted, green-blue cat-like eyes, a very small nose and mouth, very smooth olive green skin, broad shoulders, a very thin body. And he says that this figure held up its hand, palm first, in greeting. And as Walter says, I find it quite impossible to describe the emotion produced in me by the sight of this being. He had very beautiful eyes, which gave me a strange and very sweet sensation. I felt myself as free and light as a feather. At the same time, I also felt quite calm, and I gazed at him eagerly. Now it was at this point that a lengthy telepathic conversation ensued, and in fact, as soon as Walter was able to form a question in his mind, it was instantly answered. He first asked, where do they come from? And the being replied that their planet is ten times the size of Earth and has two suns, resulting in very long days and just a brief night. He said they have vegetation and animals very much like ours, but of slightly different shapes and sizes. He says that they have very high mountains and immensely tall trees. The being told Walter that all their work is done automatically, that they are able to accomplish all kinds of physical tasks using psychic abilities. He said that they subsist on fruit and vegetables and grains. Walter's asking all these questions and he's answering them. He said that they have cured pretty much all illness and disease on their planet. They said Earth's gravity was quite light for them. And in fact, that matched what Walter said because as this being approached, it kind of approached to him in a light, hopping manner. And so he's staring at this being and he asked this being, was he a man or a woman? And the being replied that he was neither and that they reproduce in ways that are different from ours. At this point, Walter reached out to touch him, but felt this same sort of magnetic force field, which prevented him from approaching the craft. He tried a couple of times to reach out and touch this being, but could not do it. And the being started to describe the craft and told Walter that he was looking at a smaller craft and that it actually came from a mothership which was the same basic shape, but much larger, about five kilometers in diameter, and that it contained many other craft, both manned and unmanned. Uh, Walter asked how they travel throughout the universe, and they said that they use what he would think of as a magnetic drive. They said that they could not stay too long in Earth's system, as it causes them to age rapidly. But when he asked how old they were, he says that they live about a hundred times longer than humans. At one point, Walter asked them if they had defensive weapons. And the being said that they can disintegrate anything, even at great distance. And offered to actually demonstrate this to Walter. He instructed Walter to throw a rock at the craft. So Walter picked up a rock and threw it at it, as he says. I hurled the stone with all my might right at the cupola, whereupon a whitish lilac-colored lilac beam of light shot out from it and the stone exploded with a dull report, and I saw not even a single fragment of it fall to the ground. So this was absolutely a very long, involved conversation. And as Walter says, I asked him, why they are not willing to help us with their technology and remain on our planet, and also 
how long it would be before we had their kind of technology. He gave me to understand that first, they are not allowed to interfere in the development of another planet. Secondly, he said we would never reach their level of evolution since the crust of our planet is far too variable and that in the near future, there will be a displacement of our poles. In the process of the adjustment to this polar shift, an enormous crack would develop on the surface of our planet, and this would entail an upheaval on the Earth that would destroy 80% of all living things here, leaving the survivors to carry on in a habitable strip of the planet. So this was quite alarming. It certainly does match up with what other witnesses have learned from the ETs. And then Walter asked the ET if they believed in God. He said the ET seemed surprised by the question and said that, quote, everything is God. We, nature, the planets, rocks, grass, in fact, everything that exists. And it was about this time that the robotic-looking device began to float up and enter into the craft, and Walter understood that it was time for the ET to go. The other being that was still up in the cupola made a gesture of acknowledgement to Walter. Walter then asked them for an artifact of theirs, and the being said no, as it would be harmful to him, to Walter. At this point, overcome with emotion, Walter began weeping. And he actually knelt down and first asked and then begged for the E.T. to take him with them. He was ready to leave Earth and everything behind. But the E.T. said that no, neither Walter nor anyone from Earth can go with them, but that he was very lucky to have met them and had this conversation. The being then returned to the craft, and Walter says this force field pushed him uh, a further distance from the craft, and at this point, the craft grew dim. This opposing force field pushed Walter further away. And the craft then lit up, rose from the ground, made a loud whistling sound, and shot straight up at super high speed and disappeared. At this point, Walter became absolutely overcome with despair. He realized he was covered with sweat. He returned to his car in a complete daze. After recovering, he went to his destination. He tried to tell his family and friends what happened. Was very disappointed to discover that they were skeptical. And because of that, he ended up keeping secret about his encounter for about a decade. However, he did return to the site about 20 days later and saw impressions on the ground where this heavy craft had pressed into the soil. He also noticed something else. The grass around the area where this craft had landed was three times larger than any of the grass around it. Another thing he noticed, his watch began losing about two hours per day. And for a month after the encounter, he said he was unnaturally tired and did experience some hair loss. Thankfully, he did recover from this, but overall, the only lasting effects was how it affected him emotionally, spiritually, mentally. As Walter says, the experience changed my character greatly and had a profound effect on my attitude to all questions of religion or politics. I have come to the realization that we humans are really still very crudely constituted and that, as the being said to me, we have animal-like tendencies. A lot of interesting elements to that case. The fact that this holy man predicted the witness would have an encounter, and then he did. The feelings the witness described upon seeing the craft, seeing the ETs, all the descriptions the ET gave, uh, the description of the ET themselves, the description of the craft. I mean, all of it lines up with so many other cases. I think it's a legitimate case. Just my opinion. As always, it's up to you to determine what you think about each case. And here's another. So many. I like this case too. It's quite interesting because it is a multiple witness case of a bunch of young women who saw two ETs very close up. 
I call this one Humanoids in the Tajuka Forest. And this one occurred on August 24, 1974 in Alto da Boa Vista, Brazil, which is surrounded by the Tajuka Forest. And there had been reports of humanoids being seen prior to the witnesses seeing humanoids in this case. And while it is a somewhat brief case compared to most of these in this little collection, which are quite extensive, I still think it has some very interesting elements to it. This next case did occur in a very rural area of Brazil. The main witness is Regina Concierge Chow, and she had always been interested in the paranormal, but what she and her friends saw on August 24th, 1974, gave them quite a scare. Regina and her four friends, their names were Jeanette, Ingrid, Viola, and Maria Teresa, were all university students. And they were standing just outside the gate of one of their homes on this street called Estrada da Vista Chinese. And this is, again, a very rural area outside of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Now, when it was Maria Teresa who first saw something moving along the road and shouted out to her friends, What's that? And this road, as you can see, is surrounded by forest. And it was not unusual for them to see animals of all kinds. But what they saw was definitely not an animal. It was walking on two feet. They saw two humanoid figures. And they were floating almost two feet above the street. These figures were dressed identically in golden jumpsuits with helmets and what looked like visors. And while they were floating above the ground, their legs moved in this watch walking motion. Their legs and arms were moving, but they were up in the air. Both figures were side by side. Regina did notice that they kept their arms fully straight and did not flex them at the elbows. She says their outfits reminded her very much of astronauts, complete with helmet and boots, but that the texture and the color was quite unusual. It was a scaly, golden, metallic texture. They estimate that these figures were about five and a half feet tall, but seeing that these beings were moving towards them, all five of the young women immediately became frightened and ran back into the house and locked the door. Because as it turns out, earlier they had heard reports about floating humanoids being seen in this area of the Tijuca forests. In fact, multiple people had said that they'd seen these humanoids and some were reporting seeing UFOs. These sightings were causing a minor panic among the townsfolk of this area, though when researchers contacted authorities in the town to verify this, authorities denied the reports. Regina was interviewed by researcher Irene Granchi. She provided drawings of the beings for Irene. And while Regina did get a good look at them, she said that she was unable to see through the visors on their heads because they were too reflective. They were reflecting the sunlight. And also, she said that she couldn't, does not remember seeing what their hands looked like, but that these were clearly not normal people. I really wonder what the ETs are up to in all of these cases, just floating down the road like that towards the witnesses about a foot or two off the road, all dressed up in their little shiny jumpsuits. It's a fascinating case. I find all of these super interesting because we're only seeing just little bits and pieces of what these ETs are up to. I imagine that most of what goes on is not witnessed by humans in any capacities. So again, this is just one piece of the puzzle that we're getting. And now on to the next case, which I call, I Can't Get It Out of My Mind. That being, of course, a direct quote from the witness who had this encounter, which is actually a multiple witness encounter, though it isn't just one simple sighting. In fact, this gentleman apparently did have missing time. This case occurred in July of 1975 in Edgewater, British Columbia, Canada. And it's a super fascinating case which shows how missing time can be almost seamless 
when someone has a very close encounter. And of course, he saw humanoids, or what appear to be humanoids. The main witness in this case is Frank Slada. He's pictured here. And it was one evening in July of 1975 that Frank was driving his wife home to their place of residence in Edgewater. His wife worked at the Radium Hot Springs Lodge, and in fact, so did he. So he went to pick her up. Along with him was their daughter, Linda, as well as two of their neighbors. And they left the Radium Hot Springs Lodge and had just reached the highway and gone about a mile when they noticed, all of them, an unusually bright star-like light directly above a ridge to their right. And Linda shouted out, that light's moving, and she's pointing at it. Uh, they could see it was unusual, so Frank quickly stopped the car, and they all rolled down the windows to get a better look. And as Linda says, the light moved a little more, blanked out, then all of a sudden it was over the hill above the power station. And by that, she means a sort of transformer unit that was alongside the highway. So they were all a bit puzzled by it, but they just decided to continue driving home. Now, Frank worked at the Radium Lodge as a night watchman, and he had to return there in just a few minutes for his shift. So he dropped his wife and everyone else off at the house and turned around and began his drive back to the lodge. And coming around that corner where they had seen the unidentified light, there it was again. And as Frank says, in his own words, I looked up and saw the light real close, right above the power station. So I slowed right down, and then, and there, I saw there were three strange-looking sort of orangey beams shining down. They were large, and I could see everything even the needles on the pine trees. So realizing he had stopped in the middle of the road, Frank pulled over, stopped the car on the side. He said other cars continued to drive by, but strangely, none of them stopped. None of them seemed to notice this very obvious UFO, because Frank could now see that this wasn't just a light. It was some sort of craft. And as he says, it was a double-shaped deal about 40 feet wide, maybe more. On top, there was a part with rectangular windows lit from the inside, and below, there was a larger part with lights shining out from the rim. So this craft, as you can see, is pretty much saucer-shaped, circular, with a dome on top. He estimates this dome was somewhere about 6 to 8 feet high, and it had a long window in the center. He was close enough that he could hear it making a low swishing noise. And as he stared at it, Frank noticed that there was movement inside. Something alive was inside of it. But he found himself almost hypnotized and entranced by the sight. As he says, For some reason, I couldn't take my eyes off of it. Twice, while I looked, I saw a shadow moving by as if there was somebody inside. I couldn't see a head or anything, it was just a shadow, and it seemed that maybe there was more than just one. And finally, and suddenly, Frank came out of his trance and pulled his eyes away from the object. And fearing that he might be late for work, he looked at his watch and he got an incredible shock because more than an hour had passed while he watched the object. And as he says, I thought it was more like 10 minutes. So he quickly drove to the lodge only one mile away, and as he exited his car, he looked over towards where the area where he had seen the object and was amazed to see it off in the distance, brilliantly lit. It had moved upwards and was now visible above the ridge where it had been hovering. And he had the impression that it was almost as if the occupants of this object had wanted him to see it. So Frank rushed into the lodge and called his wife on the phone. And this is when he learned it was now 1.30 a.m. He was supposed to start work at midnight, so he definitely had missing time. The next morning, he returned to the site in hopes of finding some evidence. He had to find a back road that took him partway up the ridge and hike the rest of the way. He was determined. But as he says, but there was nothing. 
I spent an hour looking around, but there wasn't a sign it had been there. So it must have been in the air all the time, even though it looked as if it was on the ground. The only thing he did notice was that there was a power pole right below where the object had hovered. But it was an experience that he would remember for the rest of his life. There you go. One more case, one more piece of the puzzle towards understanding what is going on on our planet. I mean, so many cases. I don't know how skeptics still exist on this planet. <laughs> There's just far too many cases, far too much evidence, far too many witnesses for this all to be explained as hoaxes, hallucinations, or misperceptions, as our government has tried so hard to convince us for so many decades. And now let's move on to the next case, another favorite for sure in this collection. I call this one, I Didn't Dare Say Anything. And what's interesting about this case is it started out with a single witness who saw a landed UFO, a very unusual humanoid, but the case continued on over a period of days and ended up involving more than a dozen witnesses. So it's a really remarkable case with multiple witnesses involving some absolutely unusual interactions with different types of ETs, as it turns out. The location of this next encounter in Domaine, Isier, France, is a tiny little town. And it was at 5.50 p.m., again on January 5, 1976, that 10-year-old Jean-Claude Silvente had a remarkable encounter that would actually presage a series of even more exciting events. He was outside his home, walking through a vacant lot, when without warning, a craft landed about 30 feet away from him. It was, he estimates, 15 feet high, glowing white, and was resting on five thin landing legs. And as Jean-Claude says, suddenly I heard a whistling sound. I turned around, and behind me in the brushwood, I saw lying on the ground about five feet away, a craft which had a cone shape, all illuminated with several colors. A door opened and a man came out. He was very tall, with long hair. He ran towards me, stretching his arms out. So this was a very unusual looking figure. Yes, he was mostly human looking, but he was very tall, blonde hair, long blonde hair, but he wore this tight fitting kind of shiny full body jumpsuit that was very unusual. And even more unusual, Jean-Claude noticed that there were strange glowing green objects or rings on his hand. At this point, Jean-Claude sneezed, the tall visitor turned and looked at him, and that's when it started coming towards him, and Jean-Claude panicked and ran. And as he says, I thought I was dreaming. When I got back, I didn't dare say anything. Now his mother could see that something had clearly frightened her son, as she says, my son was terrified. I had never seen him like that. But he didn't want to talk about it. And it was the next evening, January 6, that was even more amazing, because at 6 p.m., Jean-Claude went outside his home to get some milk and saw this same tall figure again. He didn't see the craft, just the figure, but this figure was following him down the sidewalk about 80 feet away. And as Jean-Claude says in his own words, coming back at the side of the road under a tree, I saw the same man as the day before. He was wearing a shiny jumpsuit, and once again he stretched out his arms, wanting to run after me. On one hand, he had a big green ring. So Jean-Claude ran home. He spilled the, all the milk he had collected. His mother, again, seeing her son terrified, became very curious about what was going on. And as she says in her own words, I wanted to get to the bottom of it. With my daughter, Eliane, and a friend of hers, Marcel Solvini, we took a flashlight and ran to the place indicated by Jean-Claude. No sooner had we arrived at this place that we saw a big red headlight coming down from the sky, which advanced in our direction. I had never seen such a thing. We did not ask for more, and I immediately rushed, rushed to the gendarmerie, 
which happens to be very close to my house. So these are the police. And all of these witnesses felt that this object was coming down almost as if it was going to land right on top of them. This is what they told the police. The police listened and returned to the encounter location. By this time, there was nothing unusual to be seen. However, it turned out that many other people had seen this same object on that night. There was a Monsieur Tal Talefer, who was the mayor of the nearby town of Clay. He said that around 5 p.m. he saw an unusual luminous object moving around in the sky. Two other young children in this area, Annalise and Hinager, said that they saw the same strange tall being that Jean-Claude had described. And in fact, one of the girls confirmed the details described by Jean-Claude, saying that the being wore a shiny jumpsuit and held in his hand, quote, something very shiny and green. So the police started conducting an investigation, and they found a total of at least 15 people who said that they saw UFOs in that area on that night. And it was only two days later, on January 8, that a 17-year-old boy, again in Domaine, went to the police to report that he had seen a UFO land in the same exact spot that Jean-Claude had seen the UFO. The 17-year-old told the police, and I quote, Thursday, around 9, when I was at the entrance of Domaine, I saw arriving in the air a big bright light, red and yellow. When it approached, I distinguished a conical object about 20 meters in diameter at the base. The object went to land not far from the National Road on a deserted ground. Taken by fear, I ran away. So he said the object was 25 feet high, and the reason he ran away because he saw this glowing humanoid form emerge from the craft, and that was enough for him. But events were still in progress because the next evening, January 9th, in the town of Echevi, which is very close to Domaine, a gentleman by the name of Jean Dolecki was driving home when he saw this weird ball of light zooming across the sky, coming towards him as it was descending, and he watched it as it landed by the side of the road. He said it was about 40, 45 feet wide, 50 to 60 feet high, and cylindrical in shape with a narrow center. And I'll just quote Jean Dolecki firsthand, because as he says regarding this craft, it had the shape of an Italian coffee maker. It shone as if it were covered with silver paper. I certainly thought it was going to crash onto my truck or right in the middle of the road. I braked, then pulled over to the right, fascinated by this light. I cut off the ignition, left my lights on, and got out of the truck. I don't believe the machine was resting directly on the ground because the bottom of it emitted a bizarre light which did not diffuse around. I admit that I was afraid. I retreated a few meters without daring to get back into my truck. Then, in the upper part of the sphere, a door opened that looked to be about two meters high. I felt more and more disquieted. Suddenly, three forms were framed in the opening, three forms that seemed to be dressed in aluminum diving suits. They were not men, no, I can assure you of that. Rather, they were giant robots of the same height as the door. They descended very rapidly from the machine. I saw then that they had small legs and for arms, a sort of telescopic pole that made me think of a fishing rod. As to their heads, they resembled a square shape. The three beings moved away from the sphere. They walked like mechanical toys by jumps, wagging their poles up and down. I did not move. I could hardly breathe. I could only think that the headlights of my truck, which I had left on, would surely attract them. But no, they didn't even seem to notice me. After about ten minutes, the robots re-entered their craft, the door closed again, and the lights went out except for the top level of the sphere, which remained the same blinding white. Then the machine took off, disappearing at dizzying speed. I got back in my truck. Once in the cab, 
I made the sign of the cross. I was trembling so much, I couldn't get started. But there was only one thing I wanted to do, to get home. So this really quite frightened him, and events were still in progress. One day later, on the morning of January 10th, a political science student by the name of Hubert Martin saw a glowing bright light sitting on the ground near the village of Vainon. He said this object was about as big as a house. And it was that same evening, a Monsieur Masseron was sleeping in his trailer in nearby Calvados when he was woken up by banging sounds on the trailer, followed by scratching noises, and then his trailer began to actually shake. So looking outside, he saw a glowing egg-shaped object not too far away, about five feet wide or tall, three feet wide, and it was landed or close to it on the ground. He says it was greenish on top, reddish on the bottom, and as he watched, it rose up in a strange spiral motion, hovered at 50 feet, then disappeared. And he opened his door to investigate, and he heard voices talking, saying what sounded like letters. And he saw the dark silhouette of a human form running by, but it wasn't normal because it was tilted at a very strange angle. And unknown to him, around the same time, there was a Mrs. Zamora who lived in the same trailer park. She woke up also hearing a strange voice, which she thought was saying, what shall I do? And she heard another voice answering, do as I do. And looking outside, she saw the same craft, which appeared to be yo-yoing up and down. And later, researchers investigating the area says that they did find strange footprints at the site. So with this, the whole series of events came to an end, or people stopped talking, but it certainly left many people convinced in that area that there was something about that area that was drawing in UFOs. As for the first witness, Jean-Claude Silvente, he was left pretty traumatized by the encounter and especially by all the incoming reports. And according to his mother, Jean-Claude refused to go outside at night and stayed locked up inside the house when evening approached. So that's the kind of case that makes me wonder because it may have all gone completely unreported if that first witness, Jean-Claude Silvente, hadn't come forward. Because it was only the fact that he came forward and his case was publicized that other people started coming forth. So if he hadn't, the whole series of events could have gone completely under the radar. We would never know about it. And I suspect that's what's happening with most. Even ones that are reported. If people go to the police and we don't hear about it, so, again, much more common, I think, than people realize. And what an interesting series of events that was with these robotic-like humanoids, this really tall, human-looking ET with long blonde hair. I'm always wondering what these guys are up to <laughs> visiting our planet. And here's another case, which also got quite a bit of publicity and led to more people coming forward to share their accounts of their encounters. This one I call, I Saw a Figure. This occurred on January 19, 1976, in the very little town of Heisler, New Jersey. And it's such an interesting case because there's a group of seven witnesses two families, two you know, neighbors of each other, who had a very, very close up encounter with a UFO, and one of them saw humanoids looking down at her through the window. It's a fascinating case. It was around 7.30 p.m., again on January 19, 1976, that Kay Peterson and Vi Camp, friends, were leaving Kay's home on Schoolhouse Lane pictured here in Heislerville, New Jersey, a very tiny town, and they both saw this very unusual object with two extremely bright lights on it hovering over the woods at treetop level to the west of their house, about 900 feet away. And it was immediately apparent to them that they were seeing a UFO. That's how unusual it was. So they immediately called out their neighbors, Wayne Tomlin, his wife, and their two children, 
who came running out of their home to see the UFO. At the same time, Kay's son also ran out of the house to watch it. So now there's seven witnesses watching it. And as Vi Camp says, we couldn't hear a sound. It was just sitting in mid-air just above the trees. So all seven of them watched this object for just a few moments. They said the lights were really too bright for them to discern what kind of shape this object was, though they could see it was a solid object. But finally, Vi became curious and decided to approach a little bit more close to this object. And as she did, the bright white lights on the object suddenly became dim and turned a golden amber color. And this frightened Vi, and she immediately ran back to the group, at which point the lights became bright again. So they continued watching, and a few moments later, the lights became dim again, turned that same golden amber color, and now began to move in a straight line right towards them. And in fact, it came directly over their heads and stopped. And this is when they could see the shape of this craft, that it was actually sort of boomerang shaped. You can see their drawings here. On the bottom, some of the witnesses saw a series of three or four red lights on either side of the V. In the center was a large illuminated orange circle with weird looking sort of grid lines to it. Now Vi, apparently the curious one, decided to walk over to the street to get a more head-on view of this object. And doing so, she was able to see a dome or bubble-shaped cockpit in the front top section. And looking through this transparent section, she was amazed to see a, quote, man-sized silhouette showing the upper torso, arms, and head of a figure. As Vi says, I saw a figure in a small window. It was all dark, but it appeared like a figure form from the waist up, the form of a body. Now, one of the witnesses, Miss Tomlin, says she also noticed what looked like a glass cabin lit up from the inside, and she says she did see movement inside as well, but she couldn't say for sure whether this was a figure or perhaps just reflections moving around. But she was certain that the craft itself was very unusual. And it was so close at this point that all of them could hear this low humming noise. And they saw what looked like short stubby wings or protrusions on the edge of this V shape. And as Miss Tomlin says, We see airplanes, helicopters, and crop dusting planes all the time. But I never saw an airplane move so slow and without making a noise, except it sounded like a refrigerator, a low humming. So finally, this craft moved off towards the East Point Lighthouse, and unknown to them, about 20 miles to the north in the town of Dorothy, uh, Mrs. Charles Morris was at her home on Cape May Avenue around 7.45 p.m., and she describes seeing an object as, quote, red with brilliant lights off it and extending below it. It wasn't a steady beam, but brilliant flickering light. I called to my son to look, and we watched while it hovered and made a small circle, then disappeared as though it was rotating on its own axis, and the lights just faded away right on the spot. I never saw anything like it. I was captivated by it. And events were still in progress, because it was the next morning at 5 a.m. that patrolman Frank Ingargolia, who you can see here, and a press reporter said that they both saw strange lights near Ventnor, New Jersey. And in fact, patrolman said it approached to within a thousand feet of him and frightened him to the point that he drove off to evade this object which then began to pace his police cruiser. So he reported this. Other policemen were seeing objects as well. There were quite a few witnesses, actually. The Coast Guard dismissed these as lights from a fishing boat reflecting off the clouds. But it was this report, which appeared in local newspapers, that actually prompted Vi Camp and the others to go public with their own sightings. And Vicamp, talking about her sighting, says, 
I thought about it all night. I couldn't hardly sleep, but I thought everybody would think we were crazy. Then, when I heard on the news about the police in Ventnor seeing a UFO, I thought it must have been the same one we saw. So sightings continued through the end of January, and there were a few other, or at least one other report of a possible strange humanoid walking down the street, but apparently Vi Camp is the only one who reported seeing uh, the person inside this craft. It's a very unusual <laughs> series of sightings. Some researchers have speculated in that case that that could have been reverse engineered. I suppose it's possible, but it is your classic sort of boomerang-shaped UFO, and there hasn't been a lot of reporting on reverse engineered craft of that kind. And I also wonder, because this craft came so close to the witnesses, in that type of behavior that we see so often, a display. It looked to me like it was showing off. It's also interesting because of the follow-up encounters, uh, particularly with the police officer who tried to run away from the UFO and it just followed him right down the road. And military officials tried to describe it as reflections <laughs> of a fishing boat off the coast, which is absurd because this craft came within a thousand feet of this witness. And as a police officer, he's a trained observer. He knows what he's looking at. <laughs> Oh, the debunking efforts in this field are just it's such a shame. All right, moving along to another super interesting case. This one I call the Brant's Peth Leprechaun. And this is how the witness perceived her encounter this, with this humanoid, because she didn't know what to think of it. She called it a goblin at one point, a leprechaun, a little man. As you'll hear from her description, it's a quite unusual case, which occurred on January 2nd, 1995, 1995 in the little town of Branspeth, England. Uh, it's a pretty brief encounter, but super interesting. It was about 7.10 a.m. in the morning, January 2nd, 1995, as Diana Newton drove along the A690 road pictured here, towards her place of employment in Durham. Now she was in Branspeth and had just passed the Branspeth Castle on her right and was going up a slight incline in the road which was lined by a small fence with fields beyond, which you can see here. And as Diana says, Through the front windscreen of my car, I saw this small object moving in a puppet-like action. I slowed right down alongside it, and looked out of the left passenger window and saw what appeared to be a little man walking, about less than table height, two foot something, I would estimate. As I slowed alongside it, I was quite amazed, and I tried to take it all in, and I was amused as well. At first I thought someone was playing a trick with a remote control. It was quite dark, but I could see it from the front windscreen. I caught it in my light. I could see it from this side view as well, when I pulled alongside it. I would estimate it was two yards away. I slowed right down to observe it, virtually to a standstill. So I was in first gear, and I watched in amazement as it was walking. I was more amused with its puppet-like movement, and I took particular notice of the detail of its head and the shape of its body. The head was not pointed at the top, but fairly oval, and the chin was slightly pointed, and I could see an almond-shaped eye. It was like a side view as it was walking. And I sort of just looked at it, but it didn't look at me. I was alongside it, and it was to my side, and I was looking out the window at this side, and it sort of kept on walking. But I could see like an almond-shaped eye at the side of its head. I didn't see any other features on this character, just mainly this eye and its movement. So this creature, which Diana described alternatively as a goblin or a leprechaun or a little man, was a sort of a dull mustardy yellow in color. She said it was very slimly built and was bobbing along in this strange gait with its arms swinging like a puppet. Though it clearly wasn't a puppet because there was no strings. There was nobody else around. 
She says the whole body was the same color, all one color, as if it might be wearing a full body jumpsuit, but she wasn't sure about that. The only dark thing she said on it was its eyes, or rather its eye that she saw. And with her car at a virtual stop, she says she watched it for almost a full minute. And as Diana says, it was bloody unbelievable. You don't see anything like this. I watched it for a while until it walked on a bit further. Then I started to pull away with the car. As I pulled away, I got a few yards and I stopped the car. I was going to put it into reverse gear. I looked in my mirror and there were no cars or anything behind me. Then I decided better of it and I thought, no, I'll carry on and go to work. So Diana said that she felt no fear and was really just more curious and amused by the encounter. But when she was asked by researchers why she didn't stop and get out of her car, she said, I don't know. I can't explain that. The only thing I could think of was that it was a leprechaun. My perception of this little man was a leprechaun. And it was a real live one. It was a little man. And that's all there was to it. So after driving off, Diana went to work, and weirdly, the experience largely left her mind. And in fact, she didn't even mention it to her family until the next night, which is totally out of character for her, as she says, and her family confirms. She can't explain this, and can only speculate on the reason, and as she says, Well, I'm not really into fantasy and unbelievable things. I generally just read true stories and things, but it was too unbelievable. Thankfully, she did remember. She did talk to her family about it. She actually even called the Durhan police. She told them about her sighting, and they told her that she should contact a wildlife expert. Diane explained to them that no, she saw a little man, not an animal, some kind of life form that she did not understand but the police didn't apparently want to hear about it. On January 4th, Diana's sister decided to contact Bufora, the British UFO research organization, and shared her story with researcher Dave Newton and Jenny Randalls. They both went to Diana's home and to the location of the encounter. Diana's family vouched for her character and told Jenny Randalls, if that is what she said she saw, then that is exactly what she saw, as she is not prone to fantasy. Though, the whole family was puzzled by the fact that Diana didn't tell them about it until the next day. Now, the researchers also called the police, who confirmed that Diana did, in fact, call them. As Jenny Randall says, I have spoken with Diana several times by telephone, as well as speaking to her at home. She is absolutely adamant that she saw the creature she describes as a leprechaun. And frankly, I can see no reason at all for her to be inventing a story of this nature. She does not want any publicity at all. It is the opinion of both investigators that Diana Logan saw a very unusual creature at the side of the road. We feel most strongly that he has re she has related to us precisely what she felt she saw. And the other re researcher, Dave Logan, says, There is little doubt in my mind that Diana believes she saw this strange little creature by the roadside. This is not a hoax. So there you go. The woman's just driving along and sees this strange little figure walking along the side of the road. <laughs> it's a shame she didn't get out of her car to take a closer look, but I can understand why she wouldn't do that. Some, an event like this... Typically, it's very shocking for witnesses, and they have a hard time trying to interpret what they're seeing, and once they realize how unusual it is, they usually get on moving. <laughs> so, certainly an interesting and unusual case, which I also like because it was thoroughly investigated by professional researchers. And now we move to the final case of this episode, some of you have asked, you know, why aren't there more recent cases involving humanoids? And the fact is, there are, and there's quite a few of them. The 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s were kind of the heyday for this. 
I think because coverage was a little bit more open, but the cover-up is no joke, and people have been frightened out of reporting their encounters, and often it takes them years, if not decades, to come forward. There's a lot of reasons, I think, why we don't have as many modern accounts as we do ones that are, you know, from earlier on. But this next case I call Unable to Move. It occurred in November 2008 in Santiago, Chile. And I like this case because the witness got so close to this UFO, like 30 feet, as he was working on top of a building in a very crowded area of Santiago, Chile. This last and very unusual case comes from Chilean researcher Raul Gajardo Leopold. It was also published in Albert Rosale's book, Humanoid Encounters, The Others Among Us. It is a single witness case, the sole witness being 50-year-old Segundo Godoy Lopez, who, around 6 p.m. one evening in November 2008, was working on the rooftop of a building on the very busy and urban street Alfonso de Cordoba in Santiago, Chile, as you can see here and feeling a strange, quote, urge to look up in the southern sky, he saw a dark gray metallic object about a half mile away to the south. But slowly it began to move towards him and he could make out more details. And he could see this was not a plane or a helicopter or anything normal. And as it got close, he could see that this object was about 300 feet long and 30 feet high with a rectangular front section and two large rectangular windows, while the back section looked very strange, uneven, and kind of serrated with four points. And looking at the right window of this strange craft, the witness, Segundo, could see two humanoid figures from the waist up, standing right next to each other. Both of these figures looked the same. They were light gray in color, their arms rested on the lower frame of the window, and as Segundo watched, these figures moved in sort of this clumsy, sideways fashion, in unison, as if they were looking for something, or perhaps watching the landscape. That was his impression. He thought they were looking at the environment around them, which is, in fact, as you can see, filled with many unusually shaped buildings with unique architecture. But this craft got closer and closer, and he saw how unusual this craft and humanoids were, at which point he decided it might be a good idea to alert his co-workers who were on the lower floor. But the moment he had that thought, he found himself unable to move his body. He says the only part of his body he could move were his eyes. He felt no fear, but he says he did sense an increase in atmospheric pressure which became more dense as the object approached more closely. And in fact, it came very close. He estimates to about 30 feet away from where he was working, again on the top of a building, and stayed there for just a second and then moved off very slowly in a straight line toward, towards Mount Monkehu of the nearby range of the Andes Mountains. So Segundo isn't sure what these ETs were up to, sightseeing, showing themselves off. He doesn't know. He had no lasting physical effects. But it absolutely convinced him that UFOs are real. There you go. Another amazing case. What's super interesting to me about that one is that this UFO is just hovering over this major city center. I have to believe there were a lot of other witnesses who just didn't report it. Hard to say, perhaps they were showing themselves off, particularly to this one gentleman, which could be, because I also find it fascinating that as soon as he thought of getting other witnesses, that's when he found that he was unable to move. But the fact that it came so close to him, literally eye to eye, 30 feet away, with these little guys staring right at him, that makes me think this was an intentional display. I don't know how else to put it. But again, as always, you can make up your own mind about it. So, there you go. 
10 amazing cases of people who are in the presence of extraterrestrials. Again, I do think that's what we're dealing with. I mean, here we have clearly metallic craft, which are leaving landing traces. They've got portholes, windshields, there's little people inside of them. They're doing their thing as we're doing ours. Uh, I honestly do believe that most of these cases can be explained as extraterrestrials in the classic sense. But what I just want to do is present the evidence so everyone can make up their own minds about it. But as you can see, these cases have been going on a very long time all over the world. A lot of people are seeing them. There's all kinds of evidence supporting them. And I think it's important that people know. And that's why I do this research. So once again, I really want to thank you for watching. I truly appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And until next time, keep asking those hard questions. Keep searching for the truth. It's a journey. Most of all, keep having fun. Until next time, bye for now.